Greetings. Welcome to River's Edge Fellowship's online broadcast of our Sunday sermon. I'm lead pastor Travis Jurgens. I'm so grateful to God that you are here with us today. Coming up in the next few days, we are going to go into our annual season of fasting and praying that we call 40 Days for Families. This is a time where we turn our hearts to God. We look at, look at ways to, to fast and ways to pray with our families on behalf of, of families that are struggling and hurting all throughout our, our families, our personal families, our churches, our communities, and our nation. And so um, I, want to, I want to go back to kind of the beginnings of, of when and, and how we started with 40 Days for Families um, in, a, in an introduction, so to speak, this week. And uh, we're going to turn to the book of Joel, the second chapter. I'm going to read just two verses, verses 15 and 16. This week we're going to talk about the call to fight. The call to fight. We're in Joel, the second chapter, verses 15 and 16. It says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Now offer up a prayer and we'll get started. Father God, you are glorified and worshiped and honored today. I'm so thankful, dear God, for this blessed privilege to be able to proclaim your word here as we reach people through the electronic airwaves, dear God. And Lord, I just pray that, um, Lord, that you will hide me behind your cross, that people will see nothing but you, dear God. They will hear no one but you as your word goes forward, Lord. And as we um, begin to, to focus our attention on fasting and praying for families, that you would, Lord, just begin to break our hearts and prepare us, dear God, for 40 days for families. We thank you and we pray for the salvation of the lost through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. This year will make the eighth year since we started with 40 Days for Families. It's been, it's been eight years now since we started. and Actually, it was nine years ago that in my personal time of reflection and uh, dealing with some challenges that were happening around me through some families in our church and in our community, that I began to uh, look at some, some information and, and do some research and was just troubled by what I was finding relative to families in America. And knowing how God views family and that God established family as the first institution on earth that would, that would bring the glorification of him and his name into, into this earth and that God would use families as the way that he would reach people all throughout this earth. Um, I was moved. I was I was stricken in the heart by God, and I began to fast and pray myself. And leading up to that next year, um, God took me to the Book of Joel and and just walked me through what was happening in that nation of Israel at that time. And that began um, the introduction of what we now call Forty Days for Families for our church to begin to fast and pray together on behalf of families. Um, our own families, our families in our church, our communities, and in our nation. So I declare to you today, brothers and sisters, that this, is, this has got to be one of the most significant times for us as God's people in so many different ways, but specifically in a season of fasting and praying for our families. You know, we've seen a lot of troubling things that are happening in and about our lives because of the pandemic and the, and the results and the uh, things that have been happening as a result of of people in these very uh, different and troubling times. And so uh, God is calling us to a fight. He is calling us to a spiritual fight, uh, to fight against the enemies of God uh, in spiritual places that we may see healing in our families and in our nation. And so first I want to talk about the cause for the fight. I want to talk about the cause for the fight. And so we're in the book of Joel still, Let's turn back to the first chapter and just read verse, verse 4. Joel 1 verse 4 says this, What the cunning locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. What the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Here's a picture of devastation that was happening in Israel. 
Now, the people of Israel saw very clearly why this was happening. It happened because, because the people had turned away from God. They begun to, to live their lives in many ways as if God was not their father, as if he wasn't the one who had blessed them in so many ways throughout their history. We had to follow the ways of the surrounding world. And so God, God sends a plague. And we don't know really if this is an army of, of insects or if this is metaphorical for an army of, of, of men. But what we do know is that we see four waves of this army that comes. One wave destroying and whatever they don't destroy, a next wave comes and destroys what they don't destroy and so on and so forth until everything is destroyed. And this looks so much like what's going on with our families right now. That our enemy, Satan, is, has been sending waves of demonic forces through, through our nation and they've been impacting our families and destroying our families. There's a lot of different ways that that happens, but I just want to identify three different things um, that brings about the cause for us to fast and pray for 40 days for families. The first is marriage and divorce. Divorce and bad marriages have created a marriage averse nation. We are a people who don't value marriage anymore. You know, the, the, the statistics are showing that younger generations, millennials and, and those coming along are not, are not getting married as quickly. They're not marrying as often and they're waiting till later in life to marry. And that is because of the devastating effects of divorce from previous generations that they've experienced. Um, they don't view marriage quite the same way as generations before have viewed it. Now, on one hand, that sounds like that's not so bad of a deal because truly, not only have marriage rates decreased, but also divorce rates have decreased. Um, and divorce rates have decreased even more for people of faith, people who consider the Bible as and God as, as, as that which dictates and guides their lives, those people are staying married um, at a higher rate than they had in the past. And so those statistics would, would, would be very encouraging if it wasn't for um, a negative effect of those that are waiting longer to get married. And that is that more and more children are being born out of wedlock in our in our nation. Uh, more than 40% of children born in our nation, by the way, are born out of wedlock. And so what we see is, is three levels of, of damage as a result of that. First, the majority of the women that are single moms are living in poverty as a result of their babies being born out of wedlock. Um, children are suffering without men in their lives. They don't have the God-given and God-directed balance of men and women of a man and a woman to help to raise them and, and help them to be well adjusted in school and society and other places. And then along the way, there are many men that are sitting in jails because of unpaid child support, who now um, with, with criminal records weighing them down, have a harder time getting jobs and advancing in this life. So. As you can see, this, this low view of marriage because of the effects of divorce has caused multiple layers of damage in families. One other thing that's been extremely troubling just recently has been the rise of, of violence and abuse in our families. Here in Kansas City, we see that the homicide rates and the violence rates have, have risen exceedingly, exponentially. It's been, it's been off the rails, it's been, it's been off the charts, the amount of, of homicides that have, that have been happening. You know, there's all kinds of reasonings behind that, and we know the pandemic brings about a number of, of different dynamics in, in homes and in families that's uh, causing part of that. But the reality is that these things, uh, amongst others, are causing great damage in families. My brothers and sisters, this is just a snapshot. This isn't, this isn't everything. I could, I, could, I could spend two or three sermons just talking about all of the things that are happening in our society that are destroying our families. 
And, and I, I don't know about you, but this, this tears my heart, causes me to weep inside and, and on the outside. And, and I've just got to say, if, if thinking about these things and hearing these things doesn't cause you to at least have a burden on your heart, a, a bit of weeping on the inside, then I need to check your spiritual pulse. If, if, if hearing about how the damage that's going on in our, in our families, how it's impacting children and, and moms and dads and, and our societies and our churches at large, then my brother and sister, I, we need to check your pulse because this cause is great for us in this day and in this time for us to begin to to fast and pray on behalf of families for, for yes, for our own families. Many of us can, can look within the doors of our own homes and find many reasons why we need to fast and pray. We can look around us in our neighborhoods and, and see uh, destruction and, and damage and trauma that's been happening amongst our, our families and, and people that we know and co-workers. That we can fast and pray on behalf of them. We can just look across our nation and see what's going on even in this day. And understand that there's a great cause for us to fast and pray on behalf of our families in this nation. I'd like for you to turn back over to the second chapter. I want to talk about just for a moment how God wants to use us as the conduit for the fight. You see, God wants to wants to move through us, but but we need to bring ourselves to God in a, in a certain type of way. And he defines that here in this passage for us. I'm in Joel 2. I want to start in the 12th verse and read down a little bit. He says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering, and a drink offering for the Lord your God. What an encouraging portion of this passage this is. But God is calling us to be a conduit. So um, there's two things that he says here. He says um, to come to me, and then he says to trust me. In coming to him, he says to us to, to bring your heart, to bring your heart. He says, he says, return to me with all your heart. See, God never asks us for a portion of our heart. God doesn't want to be compartmentalized inside of our hearts. God wants all of our heart. The entire thing, the whole enchilada as it was, God says, return to me with all of your heart. And that's not just any old heart, right? Psalm 51, 17 says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise See, God wants us to bring the brokenness, the, how, how even he has caused us to weep in our hearts, to bring that and lay that before him. Lay that before him. Brokenness towards sin and about sin and a humbleness and a meekness that causes God to hear our prayers and to turn away the damage and destruction. He wants us to bring our hearts, but also to bring our tears. He says to come, bring your heart with fasting, with weeping and mourning. So he actually uses in this passage two terms, weeping and mourning. He wants us to mourn and to weep. He wants our tears to be reflective of our brokenness on the inside. You see, my brothers and sisters, your tears can speak louder than your words. Yeah, you can say all day long how troubling these things are, but, but unless they're breaking you, unless they're, they're tearing at your spirit and your soul, bring your tears and then bring your repentance. The first part of verse 13, he says, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to God, O saint of God. Oh, child of God, return to God and stop living like the world around you. Turn, turn away from sin and turn your heart to him. Return to him, he says. God isn't saying, what God is saying to us is don't just make an outward expression. Bring your heart and submit it to me, your whole heart. 
Stop holding back bits and pieces for yourself. Stop giving it away to people who don't deserve it and bring it to me. First he says, and being a conduit, that, that we should come to him. Then he says, then he says, trust me. He says, trust me. The latter part of verse 13 says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. So first, as you trust God, reflect. Reflect on, on who he is. Reflect on his nature. Reflect on his character. Reflect on his attributes. See, God is gracious and merciful. He's patient. He has a persistent love for you. He, he truly is sad about our downfall. Now, he's a holy God and, 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 and he can't just wink at sin. He has to deal with sin. But God, God doesn't rejoice in the destruction that we're experiencing, though it is designed to turn us back to him. And then he says to hope, he says, who knows? whether he will turn and not relent, or turn and relent, I'm sorry, and leave a blessing behind him. He says, look, hope in the character of God. Hope in, in what you know about who God is. Just trust him. Just trust that as you, as you turn your life to him, you turn your heart to him, as you fast and pray and cry out to him for these 40 days, who knows? Possibly God will leave a blessing behind him as he rides through our nation. And this part is just, is just a neat part to me. It says a grain offering, a drink offering for the Lord your God. That God will leave an offering that you can return back to him. That's incredible. That's incredible to me to read that. That God is even concerned with providing for us that which we will return back to him. Truly, God wants to use you as a conduit. Turn your heart to him. Trust him. And then lastly, there's the call for the fight. Look at verses 15 and 16 with me, would you? It says, blow the trumpet in Zion. Create a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. So here's the call to fight for us, brothers and sisters. Here's the call. The call is a public call and the call is a personal call. He says, look, blow the trumpet and consecrate the fast. Call the solemn assembly. Call the, call the, gather the people. Call the whole congregation. Let everybody know that it's time to come together and fast and pray. It's interesting that this it's said because fasting is, is a very personal thing. Fasting uh, is a very private thing, I guess I should say, that it's not the kind of thing that you should go around bragging about and making a, a big deal before people. It's something between you and God. But, but in this instance, in this time, this, this, this congregational gathering together, God says, look, it, it ought not be a secret that you are crying out to me in this time because the times are desperate. Cry out to me. Do it publicly. Blow the show forth. Let everybody know what's going on. The call is a public call. It's a, it's a consecrated call. A, a solemn call. It should be set apart. It should be special. You know, fasting isn't about losing weight, brothers and sisters. Not in a spiritual fast. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're fasting food, there is an added benefit that Potentially, for many of us, we may lose some weight. But don't get it twisted. Don't, don't look at fasting as your, as your latest diet plan, as your latest, latest weight loss plan. Uh, consecrate the fast to God. Don't mix it up in the middle of some personal agenda for yourself. And make it solemn, he said. He said, look, rend your heart before me. Bow your humbled heads and hearts before me. Make it a solemn time. It's a public call and the call is also personal. So the author goes through and he begins to, to name names, right? He says, bring the elders and the children 
even the nursing infants. And then he says, the bridegroom and the groom also. He says, look, gather everybody together. Get from, from, the, from the youngest to the oldest. Even for the person who has just gotten married, the honeymoon is not more important than the fast. God is saying, look, for each and every one of us, it must become a personal thing. We, we, we can't depend on the pastor to fast on our behalf. We can't depend on the other person who we think is a spiritual giant or a prayer warrior to pray on our behalf. God is calling us to do this individually, personally, ourselves, as a part of this great call of the God to fight on behalf of our families. And I want to add in verse 17, because there's a, there's a very important thing that's happening in this passage. It says in verse 17, Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the people, Where is your God? God is calling the ministers in a specific way. There's a a, a verse that, that identifies specifically the cry of these ministers, to cry on behalf of the people that they would be spared, but also to cry on behalf of the honor of God. Look, my brothers and sisters, for those of us who are called to proclaim the word of God, for those of us who, who set our hands to the, to the gospel plow each and every day, for those of us who are leading God's people, God is calling us in a specific way here. He says, look, that we would cry out on behalf of others, but also that we would cry out on behalf of the honor of God. That we would recognize that this spiritual battle that we are engaged and that we will soon begin in our 40 days for families, that God will use it in a, in a mighty way to touch the lives of people and to glorify God in the midst of the surrounding world. So my friends, my brothers and sisters, it's time to fight the good fight. God is calling us into battle today. Fasting and praying is, is truly spiritual warfare. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, I just want to remind us that it tells us the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Look, spiritual warfare, spiritual weapons have been given to us. Fasting and praying are two of the weapons when combined that there are some things that only come about by fasting and praying. God is calling us into this season, my brothers and sisters. We're going to start our 40 Days for Families on August 24th. Um, each week on the, that Sunday before that Monday, I will release, I will publish um, a, a week's worth of devotionals that we can start on that Monday morning and that you can utilize up and through that next Sunday. And then the following Sunday, there'll be devotionals for the next week. So we'll have new fresh devotionals for our 40 Days for Families that will uh, coincide with, with each week's sermon that will help us to have great personal devotional times and great family devotional times that will, that will just draw us into the heart of God and to scripture so that we can have, a, have an incredible 40 days for families. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing God move in a mighty way. And I will say, you know, some of us, a part of our 40 days for families will be praying for the salvation of those around us, praying for the salvation of family members and for neighbors and for others that we know uh, in and about our lives. I just want to encourage you to continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus died at Calvary's cross. He took our burden of sin. You know, each and every one of us deserves the, the, the death penalty. We all deserve to die for our sins. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Look, Jesus is Lord. And when you place your faith in him, he rose from the dead on the first day of the week. He was buried in a broad tomb. He rose on the third day with all power of heaven and earth in his hand. He loves you and he wants to bring you into his kingdom. Proclaim that word. Preach that gospel everywhere you go and to everyone that you know. Let me pray for us. Thank you, Father, 
Lord, I'm, I'm excited on one hand, but I'm also broken on the other. God, I'm excited about the time of fasting and praying because, Lord, I, I'm looking forward to the testimonies of, 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 what, of what you're going to do during that time. But I'm also broken over the reason, the cause for the, for the fight, dear God. That as your people, we have we've engaged this world in such a way, dear Lord, that sometimes we don't look any different than the, the people around us that, that don't claim to know you as Savior. And so, Father, I pray that our hearts are broken and that we would come with a heart of repentance before you. Lord, as we fast and pray over these 40 days, Lord, I pray that you'll use us as a conduit. Oh God, that uh, that in the fight, dear Lord, that you, your presence and your power will flow through our lives to touch people, dear God. And then, dear God, continue to call us. Continue to speak to our hearts when we get weary, when we feel like giving up, dear God. Continue to remind us and call us to the fight each and every day over these 40 days. Thank you. Praise you and bless you. In Jesus' matchless and mighty name I pray. Amen. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer.